Well, good morning again, everybody. Uh, before I dive into today's message, I just want to take a moment and make sure that everyone is aware. Uh, Amos Royer went to be with the Lord this past week, and uh, some of you might have seen the email, but some of you may not receive emails. We want to let you know that his service will be here Tuesday morning. Visitation will be at 10 o'clock, and the service will be at 11 a.m. So if you would keep the Royer family in your prayers, we would greatly appreciate that. I want to take a moment and I want to share with you uh, some information that I got from my son Parker who was working on a paper in one of his classes. He was writing on the myth of Sisyphus. Is anyone familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? I got to make sure I get that right. It's interesting because a writer by the name of Albert Camus, or in French, Albert Camus, was the writer of the myth of Sisyphus. And this individual in Greek mythology was someone who tried to test the gods. In so doing, by trying to test his power over Zeus, Zeus cast him into Hades to repeat a mundane task of rolling a boulder up a hill. And once the boulder got to the top of the hill, it would roll back down to the bottom and he would have to go back down and roll the boulder up again. Interestingly enough, this myth or metaphor was Kalmu's way of dealing with the modern day problem of what we call absurdity or the mundaneness of life. Let me talk about that for a minute. Getting up, repeating the same job over and over again, going to work, coming home, going to bed, getting up again, repeating the same job over and over again until we die. It's interesting because in this, what we discover is Calmu's manner of bringing about heroism to Sisyphus was that he became happy in the absurdity of the task. Interestingly enough, in studying this, that is essentially the metaphor for how this individual was able to keep himself from committing suicide. There's not a lot of hope in there, is there? There's not a lot of joy in that. And interestingly enough, this is an individual who has become famous for his writing because so many people identify with the mundaneness of life, the roteness of sort of this Sisyphus perspective of all we do is wake up, roll a boulder up the hill, hoping to accomplish the task, and then when we do accomplish it, the boulder rolls back down to the bottom of the hill. And so we feel like we have but one of two choices, either to become joyous in the absurdity or to end our life. Interestingly enough, in this, what we discover is there is no hope. There is no greater good. There is no God. And interestingly enough, what we come to find is, as we look particularly in scriptures, where is our hope? Friends, is life just something where we wake up, do our thing, push a boulder up the hill only to have it roll back down again, to then push it up again and to be essentially in this mundane absurdity? Or is there a greater purpose? Is there something that brings us hope? And if so, how do we find it? We've been essentially in a brief series talking about hope, and last week we talked essentially about hope in suffering. And this morning what I want to do is, is I want to talk about a guiding hope to us. How do we have hope? How do we continue to have hope in our lives, particularly when the world around us is trying to say that everything is meaningless, everything is pointless. Essentially, we live and we die, and there we go. And really, in living, we're dying because all we're doing is living a mundane life of essentially rolling a boulder up a hill. This morning, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn with me to Psalm 25. We're going to be taking a look. It's a Psalm of David, and we're going to discover essentially the manner of how we have hope, how we can go beyond the meaninglessness of life and recognize that there is great hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
The question that we're asking this morning is, in times of difficulty and challenge, how can God be our guiding hope? I want to just ask a simple question to you. How many of you have gone through a moment of difficulty or challenge in your life? Where was your hope? And where did you place your hope? And how did God guide you through it? We're going to take a look at this psalm and we're going to discover that David is enduring a challenge, but as he looks to God, as he looks to the character of God, as he looks to the promises of God, but more important, as he obeys the commands of God, he begins to realize that God is his great hope and that there's meaning and purpose in his life. And he's restored and encouraged in who he is and the situation that he is in. David writes up and he says, To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. You are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are, far, are, are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and up, upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right, and he teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For your sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress, and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased, and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. This is a poem written by David, and for those of you that are interested in studying, it's acrostic in its nature, meaning that each of the lines begins with a, uh, the letter of the Hebrew alphabet in order. Poetically, David is writing and he is talking about an affliction that he is enduring, yet what he is doing is he is turning to God and recognizing that the character of God and the promises of God and his relationship with God are what bring great hope. And so in this, what I want to encourage you in is first and foremost, when we go through life, truly where is your hope? Is your hope in yourself? Is your hope in your own ability, your own intellectual ascent? Perhaps it's in your finances, your job, your future. Perhaps in, it's in your intelligence. What I want to encourage you in is all of those things are important, but all of those things are a gift given to us from God. And interestingly enough, the world is going to try to say at times that life is mundane. Life is meaningless. Life is pointless. And all we are essentially is hamsters on a treadmill, just running, 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 repeatedly, 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 with no destination in sight. And when we look at that and we begin to believe it, life becomes pretty dark, doesn't it? Why get up in the morning? Why do the things that we do? It's just a rinse, wash, repeat of the same absurd, mundane task of everyday life. And yet, when we recognize that we're not created to be hamsters on a treadmill to repeat the same mundane task of everyday life, but yet we're meant to be 
sons and daughters of a living king, bringing hope and light and life to a world in darkness, our perspective becomes oh so different. And so in that, what I want to encourage you in is watch and see what David is doing as he looks in a situation of challenge or difficulty to discover and recognize the hope that he has in the God whom he worships. The first thing that I want to encourage you with in looking for and solidifying our guiding hope is simply this, that we are to have great trust and confidence in God. David starts off and he says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Brothers and sisters, I want to just ask you a simple question. In a moment of difficulty, what's your first inclination? What's your first manner of operation? Do you turn to God in trust? Do you lift your soul up to Him? Or do you try to do things on your own, in your own strength, and in your own way? And only after becoming more exasperated or more confused do you finally turn to God, if at all. David writes, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies triumph over me. And then there's this verse. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Think about that for a minute. What a wonderful statement that is. What a glorious statement that is. And at times we can look at that and we can say, well, wait a minute. My hope has been in you, and I've gone through something difficult. It didn't go the way that I've wanted. It didn't pan out how I had planned. Perhaps maybe in this world we were humiliated. Or perhaps maybe things didn't go the manner of how we had hoped. But David is writing with a greater perspective. And what he's doing is, is he's, he's saying, no one who's hoping you will ever be put to shame. It's the hope of the kingdom. It's the hope of the future. It's the hope of his life with God in eternity. Recognizing for us that when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. We are destined for his kingdom and in that, may we realize that when we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus, we are no longer cast or destined to be apart from God in hell. But rather, we are destined to be with God in his kingdom, where there's no more hurt, no more pain, no more sin, no more worry, and also no more absurdity. We will not be put to shame. But also David's smart enough, and he writes, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. He's recognizing that those that are against God, those who are laughing at him, those who are mocking him, those who choose to live a life apart from him, will indeed be put to shame. Now, this isn't something that we're excited about. This isn't something that I wait for. But what is recognizable is God is constantly making an offering to anyone to all to come to him. He has given us his son, Jesus Christ, so that we might have eternal life. And in that, all we must do is accept it. And yet constantly in our pride, in our own guile, in our own desires, we say, I don't need God. I'm bigger than you. And so interestingly enough, in our own choice, we choose a life apart from him. And so friends, what I want to tell you is this. In order to begin, in order to have a great hope in God, we must have a great trust and confidence in Him. That He is sovereign, that He is the King of kings, that He is the Lord of lords, that He is the maker of heaven and earth, and that His ways are not our ways, but His ways are good. And so in the first three verses, David sort of lays the foundation. And the reason that I want to point this out is it's very hard to have hope in God when you do not have trust or confidence in Him. And so David continues on in verses 4 through 7, and this is what he says. He says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. 
Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways according to your love. Remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Brothers and sisters and friends that are here this morning, one of the things that I want to encourage you in is also, while having confidence and trust in God bringing hope to us is important, the next thing that I must encourage you in is that we are to call out to God in times of need. Are we calling out to Him? Are we going to Him with our challenges and our troubles? But in this, when we call out to him, there is a manner of how we should be doing so. And notice what David writes. The first thing that I want to show you is, is that we should want to know his ways. Let me say this as best as I can. You cannot have hope in God if you do not want to know his ways. Better yet, if you want hope in God, then you should want to know his ways. David looks, and essentially right in the beginning, he says, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. And how often in life do we want the hope of God, or do we want God to get us out of a situation? Do we want God to make our lives better? Do we want God to have us not suffer anymore, but yet in so doing, all we want is to be taken out of the situation. We don't want a relationship with the God who is. We don't want to know his ways. We don't want to know who he is, and we don't want to have an intimate relationship with the king. We just want out of the situation. And so brothers and sisters and friends, what I want to encourage you in is, is in order to have that great hope, it is established in trust and confidence, but then it is after or with a heart that wants to know God and wants to be taught in his ways. And so one of the things that I want to encourage you in is perhaps if you're going through life and you're crying out to God, little g, and there is no hope, May I lovingly encourage you and say, is it perhaps in the fact that you don't want to know the ways of God? You don't want to know the God who is. And David continues on and he says this, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are uh, God my Savior. Not only should we want to know his ways, not only should we want to be led by him, but we should want to have him teach us and lead us in the truth. It is one thing to want to know God. It is a whole nother to be want to be led in his ways. And then it is a whole nother to want to be led in his truth. What do we mean by that? Well, we can be taught his ways. We can hear his ways. We can see and learn and read his ways. But we can also choose to reject them. And so in humility, when we want hope in God, may we first recognize that our trust and confidence needs to be in Him, that we should call out to Him in times of need, that we should want to know His ways, but in knowing His ways, we need to rid ourselves of our pride and be led in His truth. He continues on and he says, Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Take a minute, and we could, we could have a sermon just on that line right there. Is your hope in God, number one? And then is your hope in Him all day long? Do you yearn for Him? Do you cry out for Him? As you go through your day, as you go through the joys, the trials, the struggles that are there, is your hope in Him all day long? Or better yet, is a little bit of God and a whole lot of the world, and when the world gets tough, then it turns to maybe a little bit more of God, but still a lot of the world. Wherein is your hope? And how much of your hope is in Him? 
As we cry out to God in times of need, we should want to know his ways. We should want him to teach us and lead us in the truth, but our hope should be in him all day long. He should be the one whom we turn to. He should be the one whom we cry out to. And part of the reason why we do, David continues, he says, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. We all should rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins and in the mercy of God. David is looking back, obviously, to some sins that he committed back in his day, realizing that God has forgiven him and declared him righteous before the king. And in that, he's asking again for God to be merciful and gracious to him. One of the things that I want to encourage all of us in as we walk with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to remind all of us as we draw closer to Jesus and are sanctified by God where we all come from. None of us are more holy. None of us are better. None of us are what? Sinlessly perfect. We all are sinners in need of a Savior. We all need Jesus. We all have been redeemed by Him. And sometimes in our lives when we're walking with God, may we look back to what God has delivered us from, our sins of the past, and what he's brought us to, to encourage us and bring great hope in the restorative aspect of the God whom we worship. We should rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins and the full mercy and love of God. And then David says, for you are good, O Lord. Can I ask a simple question? How many of you in a time of difficulty or challenge or struggle or in a time when things aren't going the way that you want can go and say that your immediate reflection is the goodness of God? How many of us become frustrated with him and say, God, you're not good. God, why is this happening to me? Why isn't this happening for me? If you were God, this wouldn't have occurred. And interesting enough, David is in a situation, and what we're going to discover, particularly when we look at the Psalms, is the situation that David is in, God doesn't just remove him from. He doesn't just kind of zap him out of the difficulty or the challenge that he is in. David still remains in the difficulty that he is in, but what changes is his perspective of the situation. Because what? He turns to the character and the goodness and the nature of God, and his hope is placed in him. And his hope is what drives him and encourages him through that challenging moment. Way different than the message of absurdity given by Kalmu in the myth of Sisyphus. He continues on, and he says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right. And he teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. For those who keep the demands of his covenant. When we drive toward hope, my next question to you is this. that we are to reflect and rejoice in the character of God. We recognize that God is good and upright. God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who leads. God is the one who is good. We also know that God is steadfast and faithful. David writes, good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. And then he guides the humble in what is right. And he teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. And so the point in this, as David looks into the character of God and realizes that he is good and upright, that he is steadfast and faithful, is that it causes him to want to keep the commands of God. For David, 
to want to keep the commands of God, he recognizes that in so doing, God is good and God will prosper him and God will encourage him and deliver him in his time and in his place. And so the crux in this that I want to encourage you with is this, that we must remember that hope comes for those who are humble and want to keep his commands. Notice that David says right here in verse 9, he guides the humble in what is right. And so the next question that I want to ask you is perhaps your pride in your own ability or in your own desire keeping you from being humble and wanting God to work in your heart to bring about greater obedience to his commands. Now I'm not talking legalistic, I'm not saying that you need to look like me, talk like me, and act like me, but my question to you is this, when you read scripture and you come to those parts where it cuts into your soul and you recognize that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, perhaps saying that this is an area of which maybe you are drawing away from God, or perhaps an area which is hurting your relationship with Him, do you just flip the page and ignore it? Do you just look and say, well, yeah, you know, that's that, but man, you should look at that person over there. They've got it way worse than I do. Do you belittle the conviction? Or do you embrace it and say, God, this is you and this is what you're teaching me. And help me to obey. Help me to know who you are. Help me to be drawn closer to you. And in that action, it takes great humility in order to be able to do that. And a removal of our pride so that God can mold and shape us more into his image for us rather than the image that we think we should be. He guides the humble in what is right. He teaches them his way. And all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. There's a condition in that statement. And notice what it is. All of the ways of the Lord are good and faithful. Condition for those who keep his commands. And so one of the things that I want to ask is simply this, if perhaps in life you feel that God hasn't been good, is it possible that you're not wanting to keep the commands of God? That you're wanting the benefits of God? You're wanting the joy of God, but you're not wanting God himself? And then David continues on in verses 11 through 15, and this is what he says, Hope comes in knowing that God rewards those who fear him. Fear, not being afraid, but revere. Place him in a position of authority, reverence, or awe. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Quick question for you. When you're going through a challenge, when you're going through a difficulty, and you're placing your faith or hope in God, how many of you look and go to God and say, is there anything in my life that's drawing me away from you? Is there any sin in my life that's causing me to have a harder relationship or a distant relationship with you? Do we look inward? Do we look inward to our lives, to our hearts, to our souls, asking God, saying, is there something within me, Lord, that I need to change? Is there something within me, Lord, that I need to confess? Or do we just go to God kind of like a genie in a bottle and say, God, just get me out of this situation. Take me out of the difficulty and place me here, thinking that God is merely a genie in a bottle. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord. For only he will release my feet from the snare. 
It's interesting because you take this perspective and you recognize that David is looking and he's saying, God is the only one who will release me from the snare. Now you can look at that literally and you can also look at that metaphorically and recognize similarly to this perspective that's brought about in this myth of Sisyphus. The snare that he is in is the mundane, rote, absurd task of rolling this boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down again. And according to Kalmu, Sisyphus is a hero because he comes, finds joy in the absurd task of the mundane. But there's greater hope in God. And so in this, what I want to encourage you in is as we see and we read right here, my eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Take the perspective that's given in this myth, and rather than looking at the joy of the absurd task, place God in it and the hope that is there, and it destroys the myth. It eradicates the hopelessness because the hope comes in knowing that you are part of the king and the kingdom and that ultimately those in Christ are destined to live with him in eternity where there is no hurt, no more fear, no more pain, and no more struggle. Hope comes knowing that God rewards those who fear him. And then... After looking at this, David turns and begins to give essentially his greater request to God. And he says, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. It's only after he looks at the character of God that he trusts in who he is. It's only after that he calls to him in his time of needs that he reflects and rejoices in the character of God that he begins to say, God, this is what I need. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Where is he turning? Is he turning to himself? Is he turning to the world? Is he turning to modern philosophy? Is he turning to worldly thinking? Is he turning to existentialism or absurdism or nihilism? No, he's turning to God. And this world will try to say that there is no hope, there is no God. And what I want to encourage you in is our hope is to be found in him because he is indeed real. He cares for each and every one of you. He has sent his son to die on a cross to give us all life. But not only has he given us all life, he's given us an eternal inheritance. And may we find joy and hope in him. And so in these past kind of last verses, when we fear and obey God's commands, we then can call to him in times of need, truly and wholly and fully recognizing that he hears us, that he cares, and that he will answer our prayers in his time and in his place according to his will, which is good, perfect, and pleasing. We look and we see particularly in these verses that we can turn to God and we can ask him to turn to us and be gracious Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. And we continue on and we can see that we can ask God to bring us out of distress. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. It's interesting here. Because he looks and he's in distress, but what is he asking to have taken away from him? His iniquities, his sins, not necessarily the stress itself. Because he's being drawn to a greater perspective of the God who is and the goodness of God who is. And then he says, see how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. 
So not only can we move forward and ask God to forgive us our sins, but we can ask God to help guard and deliver us from hardship. And then interestingly enough, he says, may integrity and uprightness protect me. And then don't miss this. Because my hope is in you. And that's the next part that I really want to drive home. Because not only should we turn and trust God and then humble ourselves and ask God to help us keep his commands, but in so doing, in times of a difficulty, in looking at the character of God, we can then walk with integrity and uprightness. Because where? Or what? Because our hope is in him. And then he says, redeem, O Israel, O God, from all their troubles. I want to just encourage you with this kind of final aspect. And that is simply this, that when we trust God and obey his commands, we can walk with integrity and uprightness because our hope is in him. And so I want to take a minute. And in looking at the Psalm of David and looking at the writing, recognizing that he is in a challenging moment, but then he looks and he trusts in the character of who God is. And he places his confidence in him. And then he looks at what God has done and is doing and the promises that are there. His hope is restored because it is placed in God. And so I want to take a minute and I just want you to review your life. And I want you to look and say, When has there been, or perhaps now, there is a time when you're going through a great challenge or a great difficulty? And my question is, where is your hope? Is it in the world? Is it in your ability? Is it in your own desires? Or is it in God? But beyond that, if your hope is in God, is your confidence and trust in Him? Because it's one thing to hope in little g God. It's one thing to come to church and hope that by doing so, life is going to get better. And I'm not saying coming to church is a bad thing. But what I will tell you is, church doesn't save you. Jesus does. And so in that, my question is, in having a desire to have hope in God, are you wanting to obey the commands of God. And when you look and you look at the scriptures and you read and you are convicted and God turns your heart from an area in pursuit of the world toward pursuing God, are you willing to obey? Or are you just going to say, well, I want little g God, but I don't want to obey his commands. And then in obeying his commands, how many of you have seen hope in him? How many of you recognize that you can walk with integrity and uprightness when we obey the commands of who God is? And that is what brings great hope. David starts in concern And he summarizes in hope. He ends and he says, may integrity and uprightness protect me. Because my hope is in you. That hope comes from confidence and trust in God. And that hope is established in being obedient to his commands. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we look at the Psalm of David and we recognize that the world is one in which we'll try to remove hope from us. We see so many perspectives of mundane task, everyday life, sort of this roteness of things. And in it, may we realize that we are created for a greater purpose and that is not just to live, die, and be merry. But rather it is to know our creator, the one who has created us fiercely with beauty and joy and passion, to recognize that this God has 
loved us and loves us so much that he's given us his son to die on a cross so that we might have life through him. And that when we've placed our faith and trust in him, we no longer die, but yet we live. And that's all because of what Jesus has done for us. May we realize that our hope is not in this world, it is not of the things of the earth, but rather our hope is in our creator, the sustainer of all things, the maker of heaven and earth. Our hope is in the kingdom where there is no hurt and no more sin and no more pain. Our hope is to be reunited with our Savior where we will worship him throughout eternity. And Father, in that, I pray that we would realize that in this world, in having a guiding hope, as David puts it, that our trust and confidence is placed in you, and that in so doing, we have a heart and a desire to want to obey your commands, to want to see what it is that you have for us, to allow your word to permeate our hearts and our lives and to transform us more into your image rather than the image of the world. We just thank you. We love you. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask it all by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, amen.